Welcome to our fourth Women in Hardware video. I'm here with Danielle Applestone, CEO of Bantam Tools, as well as Limor Freed, the co-founder and lead engineer of Adafruit. So stoked! <laughs> and I'm Alex <laughs> Glow with Hackster.io. Uh, so what is Bantam Tools? Bantam Tools is a hardware and software company, and we build the Bantam Tools desktop PCB milling machine. And it is used for what you might think, milling PCBs on your desktop. And we focus on professional reliability and precision because we want people to be able to make their products uh, as quickly as possible. We have one here. I make one. I use it all the time. Awesome. Yay. <laughs> uh, and I, cause I've known you for a long time, mm -hmm. actually. And um, when I knew you at MIT, I never, you never talked about milling machines or CNC machines. <laughs> How did you get from being an MIT student to being the CEO of Bantam Tools? Yeah. How is it? You're like, yeah. Yeah, I was like, oh, yeah. Well, I remember the, you know, the first time, one of the first times we hung out, uh, we, were in the, we were in MITRES at MIT, and I was working on an electronics project, my first ever electronics project, which didn't go very well. But what was <laughs> this was before Adafruit. Yeah, totally. It was uh, binaural microphones, because I was really into recording music at the time. Yeah. And it was a thing I read about and <laughs> tried to make it work. But, um, I was always into making things, of course, but manually, you know, with scroll saws, my favorite saw. And so after, after I graduated, there was this opportunity to work on a government project to build desktop-sized CNC machines for the classroom. And so I had never used a CNC machine before that, before that point. So you're hired into this job and you're like, yeah. I'm going to have to figure out CNC machines. Yeah. And you did. Yeah, totally. The first ever thing I milled is on YouTube. It was like a wax thing and I was so, so, so stoked about it. Yeah, cool. You mentioned that people mostly use them for PCBs, but clearly people are putting them to other uses. Like mm -hmm. I've seen people make little pins, like lapel pins and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, have you seen any other cool applications that people are using these for? Yeah, one of my favorites is in the area, it's like biotech. Uh -huh. So people need to build really small plastic structures with very precise grooves in them to right. do testing with like, basically it's like s small volumes of liquid, mixing them together, seeing what grows in them, all kinds of stuff. So I love the, the kind of research end of things, cool. but also people are using them for, for crafts. There's a number of jewelers who use the product to, you know, their whole Etsy store is based, based around what they can make with it. So you, um, you got this job and you were like making stuff out of wax and it was for education. Mm -hmm. And then how did that turn into what is now a professional tool? Yeah. Well, we were making it for education because we were on a government grant mm -hmm. and their goal was to put shop class back into high schools, but this time not just, you know, welding and hand tool skill type stuff, but to teach kids digital design and CNC manufacturing. So something that was more aligned with the direction of where manufacturing was going. Mm. And that project ended kind of suddenly, and we thought, okay, well, we don't really have to go after education. Who's actually using this? Mm. And we looked around and there were people who were already designing boards and having a board manufacturer make them. So we thought this would be a good application uh, for, for, the, for the product. But you know, even we, target, we targeted makers at first as well. But Why? We, well, we are makers. Okay. We, were, we, were, we were a company <laughs> full of makers. And we thought, yes, yeah. it's, a, it's a product for us, which was true. But um, it, it happened to be a little bit too expensive. Mm -hmm. And to really justify the cost, you need to be making a lot of boards. You need to have prototyping as part of your job every day. It seems like perhaps you're thinking about um, targeting a type of manufacturing that's more distributed, sort of like the 3D hubs, but for milling, is mm. that right? Have you thought about this? Yeah, we have. We, I think there's definitely a, a role for that. Mm -hmm. And depending on, of course, the size of the part that you're mm. making, it's often easier to go with a distributed manufacturing mm. option. But people that we work with that buy our machines, they like it like 20 minutes. They don't okay. want to wait at all for anything right so we you know you have an idea you mill the thing it's 20 minutes later you're soldering it up and you say yes or no mm. about whether or not it's going to work so a lot of sort of r and d kind of stuff mm -hmm. uh, and is yeah. that what you guys use it for we use it um yeah for r and d what we do is um the parts that we use for our like finished products usually too fine pitch to mill um so for those we get pcbs done 
but when I make the testing jigs, so each product needs a testing jig, the testing jig I manufacture on the other mill because the, the, we, the testing jig often has to go through a couple revisions very, very fast. And every time I do that revision, like the product is held up because I can't release it. So if I can um, make it on the other mill and I can do that in about a half an hour, and the traces are nice and big and it's really easy to put together and the pogo pin solder and we got that down, um, we can get the product into manufacture. And then after we've verified the PCB is good, then we order like a finished PCB that's much more like long-term mm -hmm. stable. The other mill PCBs are, they do last for like up to a year, but you know, yeah. if you, once you once you basically get the idea down, you, you finish the prototype, then you can go into yeah, get them finished. It's for prototyping. So you were other machine co within mm -hmm. other labs, and you were creating the other mill. Now it's yeah. Uh, now you have become <laughs> Bantam Tools. Yeah. Uh, what are your big dreams for the future? Well, we want to think about you know serving other types of engineers uh -huh. just as well as we serve the electrical engineers. Mm. So if you're a mechanical engineer, maybe you're an industrial engineer or industrial designer, what tools do you need for your work? Mm. Is are there ways that we could make things more accessible for larger groups of engineers? Mm. And uh, have you been through this process before? Well, of, of sort of transmogrifying the company from <laughs> what it was to a uh, so oh. merging or being acquired? No, I think uh -huh. this particular company, we have gone through a lot of internal identity shifts, mm. you know, going from education specific to makers to more professional engineers. Right. Um, but this is my, you know, this is my first big company. The other company that I ran was just, you know, only two people. Oh, what a software was that? company. Oh, it was. Uh, <laughs> Tell her. <laughs> Tell her. <laughs> it's called Snipe Swipe. You can look it up. I made up that name. It was a, it's an eBay sniping company. Oh. So me and my boyfriend at the time were hanging out at MIT and we had joined the underwater vehicle club, but that was kind of a dysfunctional organization at the time. So he's like, let's make a company. Let's write some software. And As so you do, we're bored. Let's. Totally, totally. It lasted 13 years. Dang. And so um, I, you know, I, I now sold out and I'm, I'm not part of that company anymore. Uh, but that was the first company that I ever wow, cool. made. <laughs> this was back when like eBay sniping was like a really big deal. Yeah. eBay was huge. Yeah. I don't know if anyone will ever remember that, but <laughs> <laughs> it used to be really popular. Um, so you changed the name of the company mm -hmm. and uh, to Bandit, which is you, you have this beautiful rooster. Yeah. yeah. And th is that like your your mascot? What's going on there? This one is just for you know the just for the team. Um, mm -hmm. But the the rooster is an important part of our ethos. Oh. Oddly enough, the bantam specifically. Okay. It's a, really it's a really small one. Or? It's more of like a punch <laughs> above your weight class Ooh. type of thing because it's a really small rooster, but it can defend itself against much larger roosters. It's like the last rooster to die. Yeah. Like Did you, you go to, in. You used to keep roosters. <laughs> yeah, chickens? yeah, chickens. Oh, yeah. Why? You go into the chicken coop after like a terrible raccoon raid, and there's one thing left and it's just the bantam rooster pretty much okay <laughs> that's so hardcore. so intense yeah. aggressive powerful small yeah. small and powerful yeah that's what we're doing you know we're trying to empower small teams to be able to compete against you know giant product development organizations and stuff like that so we Baller. internalize the the <laughs> the feeling of the bantam <laughs> at who, our company who came up with that uh brie pettis who acquired the uh -huh. company and i worked with a naming company oh cool yeah Good naming company. It was down to the wire. Okay. We didn't think it was going to happen, but Are there, there are other was. names you can tell us that you didn't pick? Um, <laughs> no, I'm okay. not going to share. <laughs> no, because the people are going to be like, oh, no, you have a better name. They're not name? as good as that one. That mm. one they really nailed because it's, it's, it is sort of a, in my opinion, it's kind of like a middle of the country name. Like if you've raised chickens, you're very familiar with it. Or you're familiar with boxing, like bantamweight boxing, mm -hmm. the smaller folks. And it just felt very accessible to me. And, and for once, it wasn't other. Like other is kind of, well, what is other? It's a very, <laughs> it's a very, it's a kind of name that MIT people come up with. They're like, oh, other. And it's like, that, yeah. it's, okay. It's like someone who didn't know anything <laughs> it's a meta about name, marketing. You know? yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so at least now you're, you're a good brand identity, but mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about the machine? Like what are the specs? Like Ooh, why yeah. is it so good? What makes it so small and so powerful? Yeah, it works every time. When you plug it in, you have the software, it's just going to work. You can depend upon it That's to solid. do your work. And I think that there's often with, with CNC machines, there's a lot of setup. 
And this one, you don't have to do any calibration and it'll just work, mm. which is nice. The second thing is, you know, it does six mil tracing space and people, I think you all were the first ones to do flexible PCBs, but we're seeing a lot of people Ooh. try out flex PCBs because they're typically harder to get prototype for. They're very expensive. Yeah, yeah. They're expensive to get prototype. Not all the shops You've do have them. have really precise depth for that. Yeah, yeah but can do it. As long as you get, it's the, the hardest part is, is the tape that you tape down the flex PCB material has variations. So you have to make sure you get it down really flat. Yeah. Because huh. that's what adds the variation. The bed is flat. The flex is flat. Mm -hmm. It's just how you adhese it. But then, you know, you can do it. We made a piece like this big. Cool. Mm -hmm. Then we put some LEDs and we flexed it. You can do you it. You just put yeah. the tape directly on top of the, the flex? Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we, we added a bunch of features that allow you to do that a little bit easier. Now mm -hmm. you can probe the top of your PCB or your flexible PCB. Mm -hmm. And now there's a dust collection system, which is really nice if you're doing a lot of PCBs. Yeah. So you can do six mil trace in space and you can mill the surface of anything, you know, the resolution is a thousandth of an inch. So if you have a coating on something that's a thousandth mm -hmm. of an inch, you can mill it off, shave oh. it off. It's actually kind of interesting. We have we have a number of uh, forensics departments that use mm. that. I was kind of wondering for like yeah. taking apart chips or other yeah. things. Yeah, extracting chips and milling away layers wow. and What's doing neat? physical data extraction, yeah. which, you know, people have their own feelings about. But. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's cool. So, so it's useful. Drill. I mean, it's amazing to see cops using a CNC mm -hmm. machine in their daily life. I'm like, this is great. <laughs> wow. wow, that's neat. Right, yeah. so, so even though it's designed for PCB use, you're actually starting to see it move into other uses and, and, and uh, from, like you said, police work to uh, forensics to science and technology, you know, you said uh, microfluidics. Mm -hmm. um, mm. Is this a general purpose tool or do you think it's a specific tool for a specific task? I think it's... I think it is for PCB milling. Okay. All mm -hmm. of the features point to PCB milling, but if it's around, people will generally stick other stuff in it mm -hmm. and like okay. just see how, how well it can do. People do mill aluminum with it as well, but it's not, it's not really designed for that. Um, so you can, you know, you can get some results, but if you're milling PCBs, it's the way to go. Cool. So. You, you, sort of the earliest part of the story we've heard so far is you being at MIT and like building your own binaural recording set uh -huh. and stuff like that. How did you get to that point? Oh yeah, I well I grew up in Arkansas. I'm uh -huh. kind of a rural kid. Is that how you're familiar with roosters? And stuff? Yes, oh, yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Twenty twenty acres, fifteen miles from the nearest town, kind of kind of situation, and so I fell in love with science. Mm. I realized that it was a way to, you know, get access to bigger parts of the world. And so I ended up at MIT and I studied chemical engineering there and music there. And from that, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. I pretty, I didn't know what chemical engineering was when I signed up for it. Uh -huh. So by, <laughs> by the time I got in my senior year, I was like, oh, that's right not chemical engineering. You don't actually do a lot of chemistry in chemical engineering. It's huh. mostly process. Huh. So I wanted to be more on the invent chemical side, which is material science. So I ended up studying material science and battery, battery chemistry and things huh. like that. Cool. Yeah. And was going to take a job at Tesla, but went and hung out with my friend Saul. And he was like, oh, I got this grant. You should run this grant. Yeah, don't go hang out there. Yeah. <laughs> Classic. Like, what did, you're not going to do that. Come, come hang out with me. <laughs> right, that's cool. Um, so some things about the machine, how, how do you make the machine so precise? Like what is it that allows you to, like mechanically, what makes the machine so mm. able? Yeah. Mm. Like some of the design decisions that you made. Yeah, there's a couple different decisions. And I, you know, I didn't make any design decisions on this machine. I just made sure the company stayed mm. in business. But the vibration is the really, really the big key. Mm -hmm. And this machine is made out of plastic, which if you hit a thing of plastic, it's going to make a thud. If you hit a piece of metal, it's going to like ring. Mm, right. And that's because of the vibration. So plastic is going to absorb vibration, which huh. is really great. And with the Bantam Tools desktop PCB milling machine, we, we have a spindle motor that's balanced like a hard drive. And it's balanced at all points in the RPM curve. Mm. So sometimes you'll get a motor and it's it's balanced, but it's only at a certain like yeah. small range, like yeah. or it's maximum RPM. You range. have to run it at thirty thousand, and that's it. Exactly. 30, 000, yeah. yeah. So we we requested that it actually be balanced throughout the entire operating mm. range, which is really helpful. 
Um, so its resonant frequencies where it gets crazy are like much higher than we run it at. Yeah. Um, which was kind of awesome. You can just ask for that. So really the, <laughs> the casing and, and, and that, and also the, the parts that really matter on the, mostly the spindle, they are, they are made by this really great company in California. So we mm. keep, keep our high precision parts local so we can have really great relationships with those folks. Because you're based and, in Berkeley now, right? Yeah, mm. that's right. And so we just buy really high quality parts. We have a really well balanced spindle that's high RPM, so you can use tiny tools. And then we also have a plastic frame. Yeah. And then I've heard that you do some of the manufacturing in Berkeley. Well, like how mm -hmm. much do you do in house and why do you do that in house? Yeah, we have all of our components made elsewhere, but then we do sub assembly creation in Berkeley. Like our mm -hmm. spindle assembly comes as, you know, 30 different parts and we put all that together. We're not going to wind a motor it. by hand. It doesn't no. make sense. You're not going to do that. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, no. Rods and, and the motors and the frames get manufactured elsewhere, but we do all the final assembly in house and all the testing and stuff. Why? Well, like, it, why not just send it to China? Like, they'll take care of it. Yeah. I feel like this is a loaded question coming from you. <laughs> I don't know. It's I get asked that all the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, the number one reason is we wanted to be flexible because we didn't know what we were doing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you only have a small amount of money, you, you can't really commit to large orders of things. You can't commit to a big time relationship with a tier one manufacturer right. in China. You have to spend a little money at a time and place a lot of bets, I think, on like, how are you going to do manufacturing? What is the tolerance that you need in this on this part? And so it allowed us to, first of all, gain all that expertise in-house and do all the testing in-house so we could really verify that, like, well, why does this machine perform better than that machine? Mm. Because we had assembled it ourselves, we could actually learn. And so we iterated quickly cool. through, you know, over, over thousands of machines, we would actually make improvements to the hardware uh, consistently throughout that, you know, the whole thousand machine. There would be different batches that we, that we made with different variations. Ooh, mechanical things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's never, it's never... Never what you think it's going to be. <laughs> so if I might interject, you've got kind of two models, right? You've got like a $3,100 one and like a 4K one. Oh, that... yeah. Yeah, so we sell yeah. one with a, a, an extended warranty and kind of like all of the accessories okay. like that you need to do the high precision stuff. So uh, a high precision collet and nut set, which is, yeah. you know, if you, if you imagine the end of a tool that you're milling and you're spinning really fast, the tool is gonna wobble, yeah. like every tool wobbles, but this one you're able to do high precision stuff. And there's like a high precision alignment bracket and stuff as yeah. well. I was curious when you were talking about the, the, our, the precision over different speeds and the fact that it doesn't wobble so much, like what's the mm -hmm. most uh, expensive part of it? Like, oh, like getting your own, part? like demanding very specific um, tolerances and things, mm -hmm. like that must get expensive, but I don't know. It does. The frame is the most expensive part. Really? So, yeah. Huh. Not a lot of people. It's like perfectly square and Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And it has a bunch of features milled into it also. Huh. So all of the cable routing is like hidden and perfectly flush Ooh. on the inside of the machine and stuff. So so it is it's a it's a delicate frame. Uh -huh. We wanted it to be that way for vibration dampening and so that we wouldn't have to spend money on an injection mold mold because, like right. I said, we didn't really know what we were doing at first. So we but injection molding has its own issues, thing. you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so that's why the the frame is the most expensive. Huh. Cool. Mm -hmm. So what's what's next for Bantam Tools? Like the future? What's there? <laughs> yeah. More chickens? It's. <laughs> I would love to be in a place where we could have chickens. Okay. That would be pretty awesome. I think like cool. Brooklyn we get chickens. People Just keep put them on the roof. Yeah. yeah, yeah I did read something about store them in the uh, the yeah. pipe organs. Doesn't get that cold mm. in, in Brooklyn. <laughs> People are into it. I think I think it's a craze now in in Silicon Valley for oh, CEOs yeah. to have chickens or something. I just read an article about that. Yeah. They put little outfits on them and stuff. Like you don't have enough problems already. You gotta get, some, <laughs> get some like wild animals. Uh, so yeah. What's so, next for Bantam Tools? <laughs> Well, we, we know that our biggest strength is actually our ease of use. The software mm -hmm. is super easy. And so we're thinking about how could we take that and apply it to different machines for different groups of people. Mm. And like I mentioned before, you know, what, what does the mechanical engineer need? What's their first, you know, what's, what's the first thing they go to do whenever they have an idea? You know, mm -hmm. is it 3D printing? Is it some other kind of machine? 
Um, so we want to build on, build on this ease of use, see if there's other products that we could offer to make it possible for anyone to make whatever it is that they can think of. Cool. Mm. I asked all my questions. Is there Great. any other questions you want to ask? Uh, just a sort of random one where, um, you know, you've got, people will use like multiple axis mills for doing really 3D milling. Mm -hmm. And you seem to be mostly in about two to two and a half D if you like count mm -hmm. the like sort of stacked uh, yeah, one axis, things. just yeah. up and down, left, right. Do people yeah. mostly just stick to those things? or? Primarily, three axis uh -huh. is the most common. Mm. Fourth axis is much more of like a, a like a craftsman style thing, like custom pens or you know legs for tables and right. stuff like that. Uh, and fifth axis is you know jewelry and teeth mm -hmm. and and sort of like the more complicated things. Like if you if you wanted to 3D print something mm -hmm. like with that complexity but you wanted to make it out of metal, yeah. you could go to a metal 3D printer or you could have like a five axis milling machine. Do you have any plans to expand to more axes on the Bantam tools? Well, we're thinking about, you know, what, what is it that people really need? Because yeah. we want to be, we don't want to be a solution in search of a problem. We want to find the problem first. Right. So that's what we're actively looking for. Cool. I know you'll do it small <laughs> and powerful. Like <laughs> so, uh, okay, so people want to get more information about Bantam Tools. Where can they find out how to purchase this small yet powerful machine? Yeah, they can go to bantamtools.com. And that's it.